can change the world. Routinely voted the most livable country in the world, Finland is remarkable. And who's going to be here to talk about it? Ambassador Kirsty Kalpi. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. So why is Finland so livable? Well, uh, because we have fantastic people <laughs> and we have invested a lot in the people. Uh, we have great nature, we have very unique original culture uh, and we are also very global, uh, globally minded in the sense that we love uh, love to have the connections to, to other countries, to other cultures. And also maybe if I may, um, the fact that uh, we have, um, our society is built so that there's quite a lot of um, security for ordinary people, irrespective of their uh, income or background. So it's a very egalitarian country and that I think um, is part of the livability. Well, Ambassador, that just sets up a whole bunch of questions. First off, you said that uh, Finland has invested a lot in its people. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you mean by that? We have uh, made sure early on in our history that everybody has access to good basic education. Also, uh, the equality aspect is very important, gender equality above all, but also in other respects. So the idea of Finland has been from the beginning that uh, we have to tap we have to be able to tap all the talent of the population. It's a small population, only 5.5 million, mm -hmm. uh, and scattered all around the country. So, um, but the education system is probably the most important investment in, in, the, in the people. Well, let's talk about that, because the educational system is one that is, you know, again, it's routinely ranked the top or one of the top in the world. What's different about it? The principle is, is important, which is that everybody has to have access to good education, basic education. Uh, earlier on, it used to be very much about uh, geographic distances. So, for instance, I, I come from a small village up in the north, uh, and uh, the schools that I went to were as good as the best schools in Helsinki. How could we do it? But above, we need good teachers. And that is probably or possibly one of the most important factors. Our teachers are extremely well educated. They can go about their job very independently and, and they are excellent. Speaking of independence, let's move right into security. Yes. Um, from the news, it says that uh, the Finnish military right now has more people in it than it's ever had and most of them are right on the uh, Finland's border with Russia. Is that really that tense a situation? No, <laughs> and, and it's, it's not quite correct. We have, um, Finland has still general conscription for all male Finns, uh, which is unusual in Europe and that is uh, what we have kept uh, in Finland also during the times when uh, everybody felt that Europe was sort of permanently secure and there were no threats inside. So we have general conscription. There's a big reserve uh, in as far as the military is concerned. Uh, they are not mobilized because we don't feel that there is uh, uh, an imminent threat, but they are, there's a well-trained reserve. Uh, this is uh, has been an important part of the Finnish security for uh, the whole post-war period. And the idea there is that, um, first of all, we have to take care of our own security. It's above all ourselves that have to, have to invest in our own security. Um, and in our environment, it is important to show that you can defend your own country. That actually brings stability. If there would be a vacuum or if there would be a question mark, that would bring instability. Uh, but we are also uh, building and we have built very strong partnerships. So it's not only the robust national defense, it's also the very strong partnerships with NATO. We are 100% interoperable with NATO forces. We are active in the EU, building the uh, security and defense dimension of the European Union. 
we have a great bilateral defense relationship with US, especially with Sweden and the other Nordic countries. So all of this taken together is just uh, showing that we are prepared for all eventualities and that preparedness actually acts as, uh, as a stabilizing factor. I didn't hear you talk about Russia as an ally. Are they a threat? Russia is not, uh, not an acute threat, it is a potential threat. Uh, we don't feel that Russia is uh, threatening us militarily, but it is a potential that is there, and we have to think about our potential to defend ourselves together with our, our partners in the region. Uh, Russia is um, active in some other fields, uh, what we call hybrid threats, especially disinformation, but also other, other areas, hacking and, and information campaigns. But we shouldn't, maybe also we should sort of see this in a longer historical perspective. Uh, we did have a, uh, a period when, when Russia was much more of a partner and, and uh, the integration of Russia to the global and Western institutions was maybe a little bit, was, was seen as, as something possible. Now we are seeing a different kind of face in Russia. But um, so we don't, we don't see Russia as an imminent threat. We see the potential that is there, but we also see that whatever Russia is, uh, it is a European country, it's our neighbor, and we have to talk with Russia, we have to cooperate and just try to manage the relationship. You talked about uh, the EU and your involvement with the EU. Uh, that brings up Brexit. Yes. Does Brexit impact Finland? Well, we are very, very sorry that the referendum resulted uh, as it did, because uh, the UK is uh, one of the like-minded countries in the European Union for Finland when we are talking about trade, economy, investments, better regulation, things like that. And the fact that the UK is exiting is, is very, very bad news for Finland and we think for the European Union as a whole and also globally. Now what will be the concrete impact of Brexit is still very much unknown because the negotiations are, have only started and it looks like they will, be a very, uh, they will be very difficult negotiations. But we, Finland, wants to keep uh, the UK as close to the EU as possible, but it has to be on, on clear and unfair terms. They decided to exit, so they will have to also bear the consequences. Um, the EU has also have the big issue with Greece, Spain's economy, certainly what else is happening in Spain with uh, Catalonia, uh, Portugal's economy. How much of a contributor to the EU is Finland or is it the other way around? Mm -hmm. Is the EU contributing to Finland? We are net contributors to the EU budget, um, but whether we are um, benefiting from our EU membership, I think uh, the clear answer is yes. There are problems there, the economic uh, uh, problems and, and uh, the question about um, the imbalance between the fact that we have a common currency but we don't have common fiscal policies, it's, it's, uh, it's an imbalance. But we are trying to tackle those issues in the EU and we think that all in all uh, we are going to survive, the EU is going to survive these huge challenges. And all of the countries that you have mentioned are already on a, on a very good track economically. Even Greece is, is doing well. They have had a huge shock, but they are doing better. And that is in the interest of Finland as well. Speaking of shock, the presidential election of 2016 here in the United States uh, shocked a lot of people here. Um, and there was some rhetoric uh, in the campaign that was anti-NATO. Uh, possibly anti-EU. Um, how does Finland stand with the United States now that there has been a, a significant change in U.S. policies? Well, um, as far as the NATO policy is concerned, I don't think 
there has been a change. It's just rhetoric? Uh, it, 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 it seems so that it was uh, mostly election rhetorics. And we are very happy with the fact that the president and, and the administration has reconfirmed U.S. commitment to NATO. Now, the, the, the issue that, uh, that was high on the agenda also related to NATO was the burden sharing. And that has been high on the agenda in NATO also during the previous administration. We are not in NATO, but we do see the logic uh, very clearly. It is, in our opinion, very clear that we, the Europeans, whether we are members of NATO or not, we have to bear more responsibility for our own security. But, um, but it is extremely important that the U.S. stays committed to European security because that is also uh, something that the U.S. Uh, itself really benefits from. And we Europeans are contributing a lot uh, to the stabilization of, of the neighboring areas, which is also in the interest of, of U.S. So as far as NATO is concerned, we are, we, are, uh, we are happy that it seems that there isn't really uh, any big change in the U.S. policy. The EU is, is a more difficult issue because um, one of the key areas where, um, where the transatlantic link between US and EU is important for us, but also important for the global scenery, is trade and investments. Uh, open economy, rules-based international trading and investment system is extremely important for us, and we believe that the transatlantic community, US and EU together, must be in the leadership of shaping the global rules-based system. And there we are somewhat concerned with, the, again, the rhetorics, uh, protectionist rhetorics, anti-free trade rhetorics. But we hope that with time and, and with maybe more discussions, again, uh, there will be perhaps not so many concrete changes in the policies. Well, I, I have to ask you, especially in light of the recently released tax plan here in the United States, it uh, seems to put a big value on U.S.-based multinational corporations bringing money back from other countries, including back from Finland. If that happens, is that going to make it tougher on the relationships between the U.S. and European countries, including Finland? I think that particular detail uh, need not necessarily be so disruptive. I think it is something that where just simply predictability, clarity is important. I don't think that's a big issue. Um, and, and it is much more the, the protectionist measures that might take place. Uh, they can be harmful. But I would like to emphasize uh, really the uh, importance of the multilateral system and the present administration in the US puts a lot of emphasis on bilateral agreements but that is not sufficient to build a good robust rules based system, international system um, and as I said if the US and EU don't lead uh, in that effort to build a rules based international uh, system some other um, countries will be leading, and I'm not sure that that is in the interest of either EU or US. Well, some other countries, I think it's China, isn't it? China is very powerful uh, as far as trade, trade and investments and, and other aspects of economy are concerned, so. Um, Finland was a leader in accepting refugees. Uh, in 2015, 2016, from the uh, the Syrian refugee crisis, and so many coming from the Middle East. But how did that work for you? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very complex uh, thing. What happened in 2015? First of all, uh, it was not only Syrian refugees that were on the move; it was a lot of other people as well. 70% of the uh, asylum seekers that came to Finland in 2015 were from Iraq. 70%? Uh, 70%. 70%. Uh, 
there were also a lot of people from Africa, from other countries in Asia, from Middle East. So it was a very mixed population. Secondly, um, it was not only refugees in the sense that refugees do need protection and they should be entitled to asylum. It was also people who were just simply starting to move when the external border controls in Europe failed, uh, seeking for better life, economic possibilities. So it was a, a huge uh, shock to everybody in Europe in because it was huge numbers in a very short period of time and it was totally uncontrolled. So that was the shock element. We have been, all of us have been able to cope with it uh, and we have been able to put uh, together measures that are controlling the situation better and also preventing unnecessary flows. Um, what is important is that, as I said, uh, those who actually need protection are given protection. And, and this determination is being done individually. Um, oh, that sounds very time consuming. It's very time consuming. And as I, as I understand it, you had a l very large influx of people mm -hmm. um, that, that came in and so many of them were seeking asylum, um, but not everyone was happy with how quickly it did not happen. Yes. Um, Finland normally would get, in a normal year, three to maybe four thousand um, applications for asylum. Three to four thousand. And in the last four or five months of 2015, we got 33,000 applications for asylum. Oh my gosh. So, um, um, but the notion, the, the fact that you mentioned that not everybody who came was happy, they were uh, especially younger Iraqis who, who left voluntarily um, shows or is evidence of what I mentioned that not everybody came because they needed refugee status or protection. There were also people who were just, uh, I mean, it is understandable, looking for a better life. Yeah. Um, there's a quote out of a, uh, an article from February of 2016 talking about the um, the refugees who decided to go back and this was from a, uh, a travel agent based in Helsinki that said some say they don't like the food here uh, it's too cold or they don't feel welcome in Finland uh, there are many reasons so what's wrong with the food <laughs> well maybe it was not as, as spicy as as, <laughs> <laughs> as people coming from um, the Middle East would expect but <clears throat> I think a serious point here was that this was a huge effort for the Finnish nation to try and give everybody shelter, give everybody food, and, and just basic uh, sort of needs of life. So obviously uh, it was not a, you know, an easy task for, for our society, our authorities, and also the many voluntary organizations who tried to just make sure that everybody has a shelter. So it was a huge effort. Ambassador, I have to put you on the spot right now. What's the most beautiful part you've ever seen in Finland? Uh, uh, nature, you mean? Oh, otherwise, Lapland. I love Lap Lapland. Uh, the hills, the, the lakes, the, the open skies, uh, the emptiness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, I love it. One of the things about Finland is there's been so much innovation come from Finland. Yes. Um, why do you think that is? It is um, uh, partially because of the education, high level of education. Um, it is, I think, also has something to do with the creativity of Finns. Uh, we are also a little bit original. We don't often go the beaten path. We, we try to, you know, do things differently. Uh, so sometimes it sort of seems we are doing strange things, but that also ends uh, up with uh, innovations. I think that's part yes, of Angry it. Angry Birds is from there, right? Angry Birds <laughs> <laughs> is from there. And so is Nokia, but of course Nokia, um, a lot of jobs were lost. Yes. How have you recovered? 
We have recovered and Nokia is an interesting actually uh, case in point of uh, innovating and renewing ourselves. It's an old company which has uh, had very many different phases at the, and the IT phase was only the most recent phase. So um, Nokia was a big part of the Finnish economy in the 90s and 2000. Um, and the rise of Nokia was also very interesting because in information technology it really started in the midst of the deepest recession we had since the, the 30s. But what we decided in, those, in that situation, the deep recession, was to again invest in innovation. And uh, that is how the Nokia uh, company really sort of took off. Uh, what was obviously the big setbacks that Nokia experienced uh, had a very deep impact. But we have been able to recover because the talent has not disappeared. So almost everybody who was employed by Nokia in Finland have established new companies. There are a lot of startups, new technological companies. And Nokia also has um, refocused its own uh, activities, so it's it's actually doing quite well again. Uh, but it's a very competitive field, so they have to continue to innovate. Uh, but we are we are doing very well. The economy is growing again uh, quite well, and one of the sort of cornerstones is really the IT sector, and that is going to be so also in the future. It's not anymore dominated by Nokia. There are many different small and middle-sized companies that are excellent. There's an article uh, November 2nd, 2017 from the Helsinki Times and it is talking about the strong economy in Finland. Unfortunately, the headline though is IMF, International Monetary Fund, Finland's longer term outlook is marred by labor market rigidities. Yes. What does that mean? Well, the Finnish uh, economy and also the social system, like also in other Nordic countries, was for a long time and is still very much based on uh, consensus and and agreeing on things on a on in a broader group, and that is also what has happened in um, between the employers and employees. We have a long, long tradition of. Uh, central agreements on the terms of, uh, of employment and that system I think has come to, to the end of its uh, time. That kind of centralized uh, agreement system doesn't function anymore well but it takes time before we, we, we adapt and, and get a new kind of system where, uh, where which corresponds better to the structure of the modern economy. Uh, so yes, there are uh, structural uh, difficulties there and a, a, a clear need of reform. We have re uh, embarked on some reforms, but they are not sufficient. But the question is how do you balance more flexibility and still the kind of security uh, that, uh, that belongs to a society like ours, also in the labor, labor market. Mm -hmm. You have talked about security an awful lot in this interview, and I, I, in doing research for the interview, I read about your career uh, in Foreign Service, Vienna, Brussels, and Brussels certainly has been a very, uh, very difficult city over the last year because of all that has happened. From the international diplomatic community, is peace possible in the Middle East? Mm -hmm. I think it is possible. Absolutely, but it's very complicated and uh, again uh, there's no sort of um, simple solution. We need to persist and the international community has to be involved as a whole. The regional players are very, very important, but uh, we need uh, again strong involvement of the international community and also a strong uh, commitment from the U.S. and the European Union. But I think uh, peace is possible. We've talked a little bit about Russia. 
I'm going back to Russia because when we, we talk about a strong player on the international community, Russia's economy is very weak. Yes. Um, and they want to involve themselves more with OPEC uh, so that they can increase the price of oil. That would be a very difficult thing for the United States to swallow. If all of that happens, if Russia is able to help increase the price of oil, is that going to destabilize Europe? and the Middle East at the same time? Or is Russia not powerful enough to get that done? Well, oil, the importance of oil and the importance of um, oil producing countries is diminishing because the energy mix in the world is getting more diversified. So any individual actor even a group of actors like OPEC uh, doesn't have the kind of impact they used to have. Um, now, as far as Russia is concerned, Russia's economy is above all, it's, it's relatively small, and their biggest problem is that it's uh, very dependent on, on the oil and gas and also other natural resources. Uh, so, whereas they may win uh, in, a, in a shorter run by playing, so to say, the oil or gas card, uh, their success in the longer run is dependent on how they modernize their economy and their society. Mm, I think as far as energy is concerned, and it's a fascinating world, the energy world, it's really uh, the, the power is shifting because uh, we are, all of us are producing energy uh, with a more diversified mix and we are also, all of us are introducing energy efficiency measures. So your, your competitive edge is much more connected to how progressive you are in your energy policy and how advanced you are in your technologies. Well, Finland certainly is a fascinating country. What advice do you have to the rest of the world since you are the most livable country? Um, I, I don't think we are in a position to give advice to, to anybody. Uh, every country and nation finds their own path. You can only succeed if the others succeed. You can only have prosperity and security if the prosperity and security of the others also improves. So we don't believe in a zero-sum game. We believe in a win-win situation. And we also believe that the only way to uh, tackle the challenges and threats is to, to do that together. Ambassador, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you.